At this point, it's hard to deny that video games are art, and like any medium, games have the ability to move, horrify, or even haunt players long after the credits roll. Get ready to relive some of the most traumatic and thought-provoking video game endings. Bloodborne is a game that revels in tragedy and gruesomeness. Throughout the story, the player is confronted by a huge variety of horrifying enemies. Not only is Bloodborne totally okay with making players as uncomfortable as possible, but it actively seeks to do so. So it's only fitting that a game of this nature would have a suitably horrifying ending. Or three endings in the case of Bloodborne. One ending isn't all that scary, but the other two absolutely are. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad dream. Both of the more terrifying endings require the player to reject an offer for the old hunter Gehrman to kill the protagonist. After defeating Gehrman, the player is confronted by the Moon Presence, one of the extra-dimensional Great Ones. The first of the scarier endings sees the Presence overwhelm the hunter with its power, forcing the protagonist to take Gehrman's place. This begins a cycle all over again, dooming the hunter to lead others like them into the same horrors, the same abyss of nightmares that the player just fought through. The other ending only occurs if the hunter consumed three umbilical cord pieces found throughout the game, which will allow the player to fight the Moon Presence. After this, a cutscene is shown of the hunter having transformed into a writhing, helpless slug, an infant Great One. This is the closest thing Bloodborne has to a good ending, considering its implication that the hunter may now be able to finally end the hunt. If that isn't equal parts disgusting, terrifying, and strangely uplifting, nothing is. Dead Space is considered one of the all-time great horror games for a reason. The Ishimura Space Station is one of the most terrifying settings in gaming. The game is full of viscerally horrifying encounters and perfectly timed jump scares that keep players on edge through almost the entire story. The ending does not let up on the gas pedal of terrors for one second either. The original ending sees Isaac escaping the Ishimura, only to be attacked by a hallucination of his dead girlfriend, Nicole, on his ship. But even more upsetting is the remake's alternate ending, available only to players who complete a New Game Plus playthrough. Here, instead of being attacked by Nicole, Isaac has covered his escape shuttle in the strange language encountered throughout the game, and calmly talks with his hallucination of her about building something. In either ending, the message is the same. There will never be an escape for Isaac. He will always be followed by what happened on the Ichimura. Many of us humans always feel haunted by the horrors of our past. Isaac is no different, but he also has to deal with actual space monsters. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order is definitely not a horror game, at least not until you get to the very end. Players spend the entire game powering up Cal Kestis, learning new Force techniques, becoming a better lightsaber combatant, and training as a Jedi. Players watch him grow as a person, becoming not just a real Jedi, but the ideal of what a Jedi can be. As Cal battles his way through Fortress Inquisitorius, players begin to feel incredibly powerful, almost unstoppable. Defeating the deadly Triller in a duel is an incredible high, the culmination of all the skills and knowledge built throughout the game. Then suddenly, Triller becomes so afraid that she can't even move. That's when you hear the iconic breathing of Darth Vader. You have failed me, Inquisitor. Avengers! Despite how powerful Cal has become over the last several hours of play, the game leaves you with only one option – to flee in the face of Vader's power. Short of the Rogue One hallway scene, this is Darth Vader at his best. He's so overwhelmingly powerful that it's terrifying. No matter what Cal does, he knows there's no chance of survival in a duel against the Sith Lord. Doki Doki Literature Club is absolutely a horror game, but it disguises itself as an innocent visual novel dating sim. The game has become somewhat infamous for catching uninformed players off guard with not only how dark it gets, but how suddenly it makes the transition from cute dating sim to disturbing meta-horror story. This shift sets players on edge for the entire rest of the game, wondering what dark, depraved twist might come next. Eventually, the game seemingly starts to break and glitch. These are not bugs, but the manipulations of Monica, one of the game's characters. She becomes self-aware. She knows she is in a game, and she has started toying with the game and the person playing it, you. From here, Doki Doki Literature Club has several endings, but by far the scariest and most depressing is the one in which Monica decides all of her efforts are pointless and tells you no happiness can be found in the game. She then deletes the entire save file. From her perspective, she was just a side character in the game, much as we can often feel directionless characters in our own lives. The Forest starts as one of those classic stranded-in-the-wilderness survival horror games, but quickly morphs into something far darker 
As the main character, Eric, tries to save his kidnapped son following a plane crash that left them both stranded, he stumbles into a world far stranger than he could have imagined. Surrounded by bizarre and gross-looking humanoid creatures, he finds himself slowly uncovering the secrets of the peninsula he crashed on. Eventually, Eric is left with a haunting choice – save his son Timmy or allow him to die. Without getting into the lore, choosing the latter will instead save hundreds of people aboard a passing airliner from the same fate that befell Eric and Timmy. It cuts right to the heart of what it means to do anything for your family, and asks us as players to figure out what cost is worth paying to save your own child. Things get even more morally grey in subsequent cutscenes that play out if you choose to save Timmy. Here, Timmy begins to show signs that he's becoming one of the creatures Eric's been fighting. Is he okay? There is no right choice here. There is no good ending. Do you save hundreds or save your son? Do you save your son only to risk him becoming a monster? The forest leaves players with only bad feelings. The ending of Transistor presents players with a very different type of horror than the previous games on this list, but it's no less potent. Throughout the story of Transistor, players never really get a great sense of what the main character, Red, is fighting for. We know she wants to get her voice back after having it taken from her at the start of the game, and she wants to stop the robotic force called the Process from destroying her city. It's obvious, however, that there's more underneath the surface. The first man the Transistor sword absorbed, who had been your guide from inside the weapon the whole game, was the man Red loved. She wanted to restore the city in order to bring him back, but she can't. He is trapped inside the sword. In the end, the player is helpless as Red takes the sword and stabs herself with it, trapping herself inside the virtual world of the Transistor in order to be with him. Players are as helpless as she feels, despite everything she's done. This is the one thing she truly wants, and she can't have it any other way. Still, in a bittersweet way, she reunites with her love in the end. Hi. Hey. Portal is considered by many to be among the best games ever made. Its story, mechanics, and even its soundtrack are all considered among some of the most memorable in gaming. Its ending is no exception to that greatness. Chell, having defeated the mad AI GLaDOS and her many puzzles and tests, is finally free. Chell finally sees the light of day upon being thrown from the Aperture Science facility by an explosion. Everything looks peaceful, the sky is blue, birds are chirping. And suddenly, a robot comes from behind Chell and drags her back inside. Thank you for assuming the party escort submission position. It turns out that Chell didn't defeat GLaDOS. In fact, GLaDOS is happy, as she explains in her ever so creepy and infamous song, Still Alive. The experiments she performed on Chell were successful in achieving their purpose. To watch Chell come so close to freedom, believing it was hers, and then being literally dragged back is as shocking as it is deflating. GLaDOS even mocks Chell giving her the cake she was promised at the beginning before snuffing out the candle on top. The whole ordeal was all just an experiment, and chell has been reduced to a human lab rat. Of course, GLaDOS does get her comeuppance in Portal 2 when, well… So, how are you holding up? Because I'm a potato. But that's a whole nother story for a whole nother video. Spec Ops The Line is a bold game, one that's meant to challenge the player at every turn. It's also not subtle in its messaging. The player, via main character Martin Walker, is forced to commit and observe one terrible act after another. Spec Ops The Line wants you to question the morality of everything Walker sees and does in his mission. It wants you to question how we as a society treat war, both in games and in the real world. Still, players want to believe that everything Walker does is for the greater good, right up to the shocking ending. Walker finally reaches the game's villain, Joseph Conrad, hoping to stop the horrors he's inflicting on the ravaged city of Dubai. Except it turns out that Comrade is dead. He's been dead the whole time. It was all Walker the entire game. All the horrors, all the deaths, all the unnecessary bloodshed, all the war crimes were carried out by the player character after losing touch with reality. This is the reality of war that Spec Ops wants to show the player. In each ending of the line, there are no good guys, there are no heroes, only killers, only death. There is no redemption for Walker's crimes, no matter what. How'd you survive all this? Said I, did. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is an adventure game from the 90s that a lot of modern gamers may have missed. It's inspired by Harlan Ellison's classic short story about an evil AI that ends the world and keeps a handful of humans alive for its twisted experiment. The game somewhat follows the original tale, but follows separate storylines for each character. Each section of the game sees the characters being forced to confront their flaws by AM, the AI torturing them for its own entertainment. 
the endings vary wildly. One sees the protagonist defeating AM and restarting human civilization, while others, like the source material, end with one of the player characters being turned into a blob of jelly. Really, there are no outright good endings. Even the one where you save humanity concludes with one of the characters endlessly roaming the lonely realm of cyberspace to ensure AM never returns, while the rest die. Even in the best ending of the game, it's made clear any sacrifice the characters made, any growth they showed, any closure they found in their lives was never going to lead anywhere for them. At best, they won and were personally rewarded with nothing. At worst, they fought as hard as they could and still lost. They still want to scream into the void and they cannot. Even if they could, there will be no one left to hear.